And yeah, Cheers, too. James Munch. Thank you for coming. Um, my pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for the invite. This is um, Coffee with Serge, episode oh, one. Oh, and it's good coffee. You like it? How do you take your coffee? No, I take a little cream, a little sugar. This is perfect. I don't like enough cream or too much sugar where you can no longer taste the coffee. Yeah. It's just got to be just enough that... It's a shame. When you have good coffee, it's a shame to put too much cream and too much sugar. Yep. I take a little dark. Yep. A little. Just a little. Just enough. So I don't quite like the full bitterness yeah. of a good coffee. I'm a big sugar junkie. But uh, just enough. At least in my coffee. So I know you, James, much for a long time. This has been, we were talking about that, this has been three years in the making. We had the equipment before we had any idea what I was doing. So thank you for educating me. I knew that the number one episode had to be you because, <laughs> because um, well, actually, you should tell me why the first episode should become you. What do you do and where do you do it? And um, for, for me and for everybody, I feel like I know, but I don't know. Right. So, so my... my my name is uh, James Mudge. Uh, my title is I'm the Director of Programming and Production at Urban Media Arts, which is our local media center here in uh, Malden. Yeah. So one of my roles is to educate people like yourself who are very curious about the video production process but simply do not know where to begin. It can be very overwhelming. Right. Um, and fun. And, yeah, well, and fun, <laughs> but it's just in terms of starting the process, like, oh, my word, you know, you know because we know we have the, product, the pre-production part where we talk about the ideas we want to do. Then we talk about the locations we want to hold this at. So once we have those figured out, then comes the production. How do we set up the lights? How do we set up the camera? How do we set up audio? How do we set up the audio so it's lovely sounding? Sound of my voice. I love yeah, the sound of my love voice. love the sound of our voice. <laughs> you say that. <laughs> if you put it on a business card, though, is it an engineer? What kind of title would so you say? I am, I am the director of programming and production. It's that simple. That's what yep. it, so what, that's programming, what it, and that's, you know, it's, in terms of programming, it's a very loose and very open interpretation what right. programming is how, in production. How does someone get to be a director? It's a fancy, it's a big fancy title, but if... Practice, practice, right. practice. <laughs> what kind of background, let's say, a person should have or not have? Does it matter what are the um the good qualities to have so you're, you're so you're talking about direct my my title in terms of a directorship so uh in terms of that if you're talking about uh like the difference between a manager and a director typically a director has um some input in terms of the vision of the direction that the organization is going into right where a manager is just making sure that we're sustaining that vision so you're like a ceo kind of Deal. Yeah, the yeah. vision for, but then when it comes to implementing, some other people would come in, find ways. Right, right. So the director's like, so talking with you today, right. I got exposed to some new lighting equipment that I didn't know about. So I'm like, oh, I'm very, so you saw me, you took out my phone, I'm yeah. snapping photos of it. So that's something I want to explore and then bring it back and present it to the executive director. Hey, you who are executive director, Tina Lagarde, very awesome. So I'll say to her, it's like, hey, we just found these very affordable looking lights here. I want to learn more about them. You know, what do you think? And we can talk about um, you know, pursuing that. And yeah, I can't take credit for it. I forget. I said, again, it was a long time ago and a friend of mine told me exactly what to buy. And so that's what I did. Um, mm -hmm. But let's say it's a young person, right? Out of high school or mm -hmm. just thinking going into college or in college. What sort of subjects, let's say, because this is video production, most and foremost. Yes. I've seen you behind boards with a bunch of buttons. I've seen you do that, but I also I've seen you direct talent. So speaking with um, the people on the show, say, hey, look this way, a little more this way. So it's a combination of both because you, you, you sort of have to be personable, to, but also sort of have to be technical. So it's... I see it as a combination of the both. Absolutely, yes. So, so one of the things that, if anything, so let me step back for a moment. Uh, we at Urban Media Arts, again, one of the things we try to do is just demystify the whole production process. Right. Um, so we start off by, okay, just cam basic camera, cam uh, camera direction. You know, what is a, what's the difference between a pan and a, a tilt? Or, you know, what is a dolly? What is a truck? And what are those com commands? So 
when the director, you're, you're wearing your headset behind a camera and the camera director says, tilt up, you know that you know, he wants the nose of the camera to go up a little bit or tilt down, it's, you know, he wants the nose of the camera to go down a little bit. Uh, so once you have um, that basic understanding and that exposure mm -hmm. to a studio production or even on location production, you start, you're hearing commands from the director like, oh, okay, that's what it's like to be a director. Yeah. Um, or the way that the director interacts with the talent on the stage. Uh, uh, you know, when you hold the microphone, make sure you're holding it at this level so we can hear you. You know, don't hold it out here. Um, and I find that, uh, especially when it comes to personalities of directors, it's, it's one, especially at Urban Media Arts, one of our primary roles to educate. Right. Uh, we're, again, we're demystifying the, so it's not, when we're giving direction, it's not like, what are you doing? You know, what are you thinking doing that? It's like, oh, the reason why we don't hold the microphone up here is because we can no longer hear you, especially if you have something important to say. Right. You know, you want to hold it, you know, essentially, you know, around the breastbone, you know, right about where we have our microphones here. What's and, the difference between a director and a producer? So... That's a, sometimes they're the same person. Okay. So like, but they're doing different things. Right? Like yourself, you mm. are both producing and directing oh. this. Although this, I don't know. I, I may be. Stop uh, <laughs> it! You're gonna make me blush. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, so the director is making a lot of the uh, onset decisions in terms of uh, how we're presenting the information. Problem solving in real time. So yeah. So there's a series of problem solving. Right. It's like okay, like for. Normally, the first uh, question, like going on to a, on location, uh, the director will say is, okay, where are we setting up, you know, the, you know where are we putting the talent? Where are we going to set them? Are we going to be setting them by the window? No, if there's daytime, there's going to be too much backlight, and that's, you know, it's going to look horrible. Right. So, you know, making a decision, like somewhere, you know, here in the next corner, then, okay, how are we going to light this now? And then you made the decision, you put it, you have this wonderful light kits, as we discussed Thank earlier. You, yeah. Set those up, and then, okay, now that we have that up, where are we putting the uh, microphones? How are we going to? Uh, are we using a lavalier, a clip-on microphone? Are we going to be using a shotgun microphone? Somebody with a boom mic? You know, how are we going to uh, approach this? And a lot of those decisions are made pre-production. Where it's like, okay, so when you show up on the set, you know that, okay, I definitely need an audio person. I need a shotgun microphone. You know, that person's going to be recording audio independently of what's going on in the camera. Yeah. How did you get into this? How did you, I, what's the story of like, just fell into? I absolutely backed into this. This is a crazy, so I was working at a law firm downtown Boston. You don't say. I was there for 16 years. Oh. And uh, during the re, uh, recession of uh, 20, uh, 2008, when the real estate bubble collapsed, mm -hmm. um, I was uh, released at 2009. So. Now I had a lot of time in my hands. I had just started volunteering at uh, MATV, who uh, Malden Television, uh, who we were before um, yeah. Urban Media <laughs> Arts. Uh, and I had heard about MATV. I think it was an article in the Boston Globe. They were talking about the quality of local programming and how it is just in rising, just, just in how good it was. So they're naming all the local places that we normally, in, in terms of uh, good cable access stations, yeah. they're naming Cambridge, they're naming Somerville, they're naming Newton, and they're naming also Malden. I'm like, Malden? I live in Malden. I've walked by MATV. Let me go talk to them. So I started volunteering them, and that was in uh, May of 2008. When I got released from my job in June of 2009, suddenly I had a lot of time on my hands. Yeah. Andrew Rosuros, who's the associate director at uh, Urban Media Art, she's like, hey, would you like to learn how to do some video editing? I was like, yeah, sure, why not? I have time on my hands. Serge, it turned out I had a knack for it. Good I was just you. naturally wired for it. So she showed me the mechanics of it. We use Final Cut, which is an Apple product, right. to do our video editing. And I took to it like a duck to water. It's very tedious, but rewarding it, in the end. There's, again, with like being a director, there's a lot of decision making that happens when you're doing a video edit. You know? Also, I feel if you do it right, nobody knows it. It's a great, it's, it's a thankless occupation. It's an invisible art. You know, right. usually if it's done poorly, that's when you see it. It's like, oh, that yeah. was. <laughs> so it, 
it's not, they do have an Academy Award for editors, but usually I couldn't name you one fame. I could name you a famous director. Mm -hmm. I name you ten famous directors. I couldn't name you a famous editor. editor yeah, editor is um, a little harder to uh, name. So uh, that's how you start. You started editing local programming and little things, yeah. and then then I was trained on the camera, the portable camera, like similar to the one that we're using here. It's nice. Look at this. Uh, beautiful. We'll go out and it's like, hey, there's going to be this little uh, art show happening out in the field. You want to go out and cover it? It's like, okay, well, right. here's a concert that's happening. Want to go out and cover it? Yeah, sure. So one of the benefits that I found is that if I'm behind the camera and I'm recording this, the material, I'm already familiar with the material. Mm -hmm. So especially when I, instead of passing off my material to someone else to edit, hey, I already know this stuff, so why don't I edit it myself? Interesting. And one of the cool things about that is that um, uh, I can also just think, you know, instead of not just covering the subject, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the event that I've been sent out with the camera to cover there, but also I can start thinking, all right, how is this going to look when I go to edit it? I should probably want a close-up of the balloons because they're talking about the balloons, you know, the colored balloons. So maybe I'll get some, you know, this is called B-roll, when essentially you pick away some uh, shots to use in the, um, in the post-production. We didn't do any B-roll. We uh, did not, well, we haven't done any B-roll yet. No, no, so usually you do B-roll after your uh, A-roll, you know, your, uh, your interview, yeah, so typically. Why would you say that is? So, so if we're talking about, like say I'm sitting here and like, oh, you know, I gotta tell you, this is fantastic coffee, you know, oh, yeah. I want, you know, and I saw you make it with that very fancy machine. So now I'm referencing something that the people at home can't see, right? Ah. And he's like, oh, Jim was talking about the coffee machine. Maybe I'll you know, you take the camera off the tripod and you go back and get a nice shot of the coffee machine. So in post-production, when I'm saying, hey, remember that awesome coffee machine? And then you can insert the picture of, you know, you can still hear my voice talking underneath, right. but we do a cutaway to the coffee machine, you know, however artsy, you know, way you want to present the coffee machine. No, makes, and then we come back to meet, you know, you and I sitting at the table. That's why they call it B-roll now, because it comes after A. Yeah. So. Well, I'm a, I'm a very uneducated person. When it comes to this stuff, um, my goal is to just have fun. My goal is to just... Rule number one, have fun during a video production. Is to learn mm -hmm. um, from people like you, from guests that I'm interested in and no expectations at all. The moment it, be, it stops being fun, I don't need any more jobs. I have enough jobs. Um, it, no, this you're, is why this you took, are correct on this that. This is why it took, it took three years for us to get together. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just want, because you never get an excuse to sit down with someone one-on-one -on -one and just pick their brain and see what, what, what they do and how and what they're passionate about and things like that. So it's an excuse for me and my friends um, and people I, I like to just get together, have coffee and, um, and just edu education, purely educational. And yeah. if someone else finds it entertaining, fine. If not, also fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the right attitude, you know? So um, let me ask you this, mm -hmm. why should people, because I think UMA is amazing. And before MATV, and I've done some volunteering there with you, mm -hmm. and I know it in and out, and it's remarkable that it's not, I shouldn't say a household name, it's not nearly talked about, because there is a huge demand, especially these days, for production, period. For, you name it, business owners, friends of mine that I know, everyone, and so, the, the opportunity that I know why it's important, but why should people care about local access TV? Why should people care about Uma? That, that That's a great question. And it we're at a point where people are caring less about it now. Uh, the, the funding mechanism to uh, fund the uh, local stations is uh, through cable, uh, cable subscriptions. So cable television subscriptions specifically, that was a tough one to say. Um, so, uh, and we find that people right now, they're cutting the cord. I mean, people are using streaming services instead of having, you know, uh, 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 Verizon or Comcast. I can yeah. relate, I don't have yep. cable, I'm sorry. Yep. So yep. I contribute direct, I just go online and I do the monthly subscription thing yep. and that's how 
I become a member. But right, yes, right. Tell, tell me a little bit why should people care? Because I think it's tremendous. I think it's very important what you guys do. But why is it that somebody should be like, I'll take five minutes of my day to for this cause or five dollars a month or whatever it is, a, right. coffee, a coffee worth of food. So it's, it's the voice of the people of the community. That's what it basically boils down to. Where instead of you put on like, you know, local news and they're talking about stuff that going like statewide or federal wide, you know, what's, you know, no one talks about the stuff that's happening right in, not only on you know, your neighborhood, but on your street or right. where you name it. So, you know, you could say, hey, how come it's no one's talking about this issue here? Yeah. Am I the only one that's thinking this? So this is kind of almost like a, uh, it's like a digital soapbox. It's a way of, you know, instead of like going out there and putting a soapbox on there and it's like, hey, why isn't no one else thinking about this? You know, you can share that, you know, like the, just in the way that we're doing it, we're producing a, a video and then sharing it on television, on cable television. And also we're putting it online also so people can see. So my feeling is it's a way to connect the community with each other, hear each other, what they have to say what issues are driving them or they're passionate about. And also, and ultimately, you know, okay, if there's an issue, how do we resolve this? You know, what thought, what do you have for this idea? You know, how do you think that we sh sh can uh, over, um, overcome this obstacle that we're facing? You know, all of us in this, in this community. Right. right. Um, so I just feel that it's, it's a great way of just exchanging ideas and um, just building, you know, that community. So besides funding, what are some of the issues that you guys have? What are some of the problems that UMA's facing beyond, obviously a hundred million dollars is gonna solve most of the problems you guys have? <laughs> solve a but, lot of the problems. <laughs> but beyond that, I feel, um, I feel it's, so I know this because I'm very bad at branding. Anytime I get to talk into we had, I have a friend of mine, Mike, um, he's a restaurant operation consultant. He did a breakdown on everything we do here at the coffee shop and marketing and branding, it was close to non-existent. So it's mostly because I don't feel like bragging too often. And I, I, it's not, it's not true though. I'm doing the people a disservice by not talking about who we are more often because we do not want to be the best coffee shop that no one knows about. <laughs> so maybe maybe that's part of yeah. what Uma's doing. Maybe that this whole rebranding that you guys did was to solve, and it's working by the way, to solve some of that. What, what you lack manpower, you lack volunteers. What are some of the issues that you guys have? So yeah, right now, I mean, aside from the funding, uh, right now it's the volunteers. So we're coming out of a three year pandemic, which really affected our membership where before the pandemic, you know, we, the place was hopping, right? We had people in and out all day long. And uh, now post, uh, post pandemic, we're getting the foot traffic back in, but it's not at the, nowhere near at the levels as it was pre-pandemic, right? So that's number one. It's just getting you know bodies back in the door and getting the community re-engaged, right? Um, in terms of branding and marketing, we have the very talented Osa Schwab, mm. and, and she's just know, wonderful. Yeah. Yes, yeah, you know she's here a lot. I she's, understand. Yeah, she's here all the time. <laughs> she says, "Yeah, great bikinis here." <laughs> Perhaps you should say what bikinis are for people that don't know. Oh, I will let you take that. Yeah. That's more of your field than it's, it is mine. I don't know, man. It's a made up name. We made it up. It's traditional now because we've been here five and a half years. It's uh, the pastries that we make from scratch. I thought it was clever. It's definitely memorable. It gets mixed reactions, which I feel like that's a good way to go. I don't want to be, if I know that if it's not for everyone, some people will love it. And some people will be like, nah, it's not for me, which is, it took some time to get to that conclusion saying, hey, it's okay. It's okay for us to, to be not for everyone. It's, it's, it was hard to get to that conclusion. Um, what that normally means is that we're more focused. We're, it's, 
So yeah, bikinis are the Eastern European pastries that we make. It takes three or four days that everybody loves. We can't make enough of them. And what is the traditional name for those? Plecinte is something, yeah, my grandmother used to make, something very, very similar. Uh, anyway. So you can see the, the word connection. You know, ble, ble, how was it pronounced? Placinte. Placinte. Yeah. Just simplified the bikini. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of a shortcut, but hey. So what that's you, it. That's a bikini. <laughs> what are you passionate about, James Much? What is, if you like, you're not at work, you're at home, and there's nothing else but time. Uh -oh. What is it that you can just well. sit down and talk about for? hours on end what a funny question stop. so what am i passionate about so i am passionate about learning so one of the things one of the big changes in coming up in my life right now is that i have applied for and have been accepted to the massachusetts college of art and design so Ooh. starting january i am going back to school Mass to raise my video skills. Is that on Huntington Ave? It's down on Huntington Ave, yes. That beautiful building they have over Yes, there? yeah, so they have a, their campus is spread. I was there in the, uh, in the 80s. Good I was figure. took some night classes there, and, uh, but this is, I never completed my higher education, and it's been a lifelong regret of mine. Really? So, and it, now I just feel like, okay, I'm at a point now where we're looking to raise the bar in our quality, what we do at UMA. We're looking to do some more professional um, uh, professional productions. So if you're like not, this one, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so if you're a nonprofit organization who's doing an award ceremony, it's like you know what you know. Instead of calling you, know, hey, my nephew has a camera. Why don't we have use him? It's like no. Why don't we get a professional organization that does this? Um, so that's what we're trying to get to right now um, at uh, Urban Media Arts, and I feel that you know I'm. I'm competent, but I'm not at the level, you know, that I feel that we want to be at Urban Media Arts. So I'm going back to school and just to raise, you know, raise nice. my game up some. And yeah, so what that's What are you going gonna to learn? Do you know some mm -hmm. courses? Do you know what you're going to learn? So I do not. So I'm coming in as a freshman <laughs> at my age. Yeah, I'm coming in as a freshman. So they're going to set the core classes that I need to take for as a freshman. So in the uh, classes are being posted in the middle of the month. So, um, We'll find out probably by the end of next week. What do you hope to learn? Let's put it that. What do you so, hope to accomplish? In so things more, uh, better videography skills. Right now, I just basically set everything on automatic. You know, well, if I want a full control of the camera, you know, what does that entail? Hmm. It entails like not only manually setting the focus, but also setting the aperture, you know, the f-stop. So you know, how much light is getting into the camera? Matter of fact, I don't know if I did that. That's just on auto at all times? Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So typically for our memberships, like, yeah, let's keep it simple. Just 100%. let the camera, let the camera yeah. figure it out for you. You're it, more focused it's on. not even there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but as Primarily, long as it says recording, that's right. Yes. Although if it's not seeing, if it does not say recording on the camera, then this is just nothing more than a rehearsal, right? Isn't life nothing more than a rehearsal anyways? <laughs> well, I will drink to that. <laughs> Cheers, James. Much. Oh, mm. so, so that is exciting. That is what I will be focusing on. That is what I've been. This has been on my mind for the last thirty yeah, years. A backpack and, and, and a hacky sack and everything. <laughs> and everything. I hope not. <laughs> I'm more. I'm, I'm not there more for the culture than I am for the for the knowledge. I mean, I really, and I, I want to raise my game up, and uh, uh, so that you know, I'm very passionate about that, and also equally as terrified as <laughs> going back to school at my age. But um, yeah, so that that's what I will be doing now for the next. You know, you can reframe it. I feel you can call it excited because oh, being excited. excited and nervous is the same physical reaction you get you know your blood pumping and yeah. your cheeks are red yeah but you just reframe it yeah <laughs> you reframe it to being excited and then it's 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 all good but i feel you're gonna appreciate it more if you're like if you're 18 i know i didn't appreciate my college years um so yeah because yeah, i was there in my mid-20s and yeah you know it was like okay uh 
At that age, though, I felt I already know everything. You know, I don't need you know, I don't need to go to school for this. But now, uh, oh the older I get, I realize, oh man, there's so much to know. And so, mass art also, mm-hmm. when you were yes, yeah. So I went there in the nineteen uh, mid eighties. Yeah, we don't have to say yeah, yeah. mid eighties. <laughs> yeah, I was going there uh, primarily for illustration though and painting. Yeah, but so I'm going back there. I'm changing my focus. I still want to learn a little bit of painting. I still want to do some fun, like some animation, yeah. you know, but those are going to be my side projects there, but I'm going to be primarily focusing on uh, video How did film. you get into law? Look, so, well, when, I, when you say into law, you mean into the law firm. Law I, firm. Right. So I did not practice law. Mm. So um, I started there uh, in their kitchen. So I was a sous chef for nine years. You don't say. You come from the, I, no wonder I get along with you. It's, it's, I'm telling you, yep. it's people close to my heart, the, the, the restaurant industry. Yep. Tell me more. Now I want to know. So I was working. How young? How s- old? So I was working on a sandwich shop in, uh, on Beacon Hill. And right next door was um, a uh, uh, New Boston Associates, which were essentially a job place, their job placement at uh, an agency. Right. Oh, and I knew all the, you know, the women there, you know, they come over and get coffee from me every morning. So one of them comes over and says, you know, James, I don't know why you're here or what your plans are in life, but why don't you come talk to me after, you know, after work? So she said, hey, this awesome position opened up in the law firm. Why don't you at least go down, just go and talk to them. Okay? At least do that at the minimum. So I went down and went to the interview. Uh, the woman, of course, the um, HR woman, First question out of her mouth was, you know, well, tell me why you want to leave your current job. I don't. <laughs> and she's like, what? What? And she never heard that answer. Evidently. Honesty, yeah. And I never ex- heard honesty. <laughs> I explained the situation. It's like, listen, you know, I was just told to come down here, talk to you, get an idea of what's going on. And um, yeah, so educate me. So they essentially gave me a sales pitch and uh, it was wonderful. Uh, I was there, yeah, for a total of 16 years. I was there in the role of a sous chef for nine years under uh, Chef Don Golden. Wonderful, talented chef. Uh, primarily loves Southwestern cooking and uh, Louisiana style cooking. Mm. Uh, oh, very talented. Sous chefs run kitchens. Executive chefs um, rarely cook, rarely are. And so we were a small operation, so yeah. I was, it, this is not a traditional hotel setting where, you know, the sous chef goes around to the, like the garden Maget. It's like, okay, we're doing, we're doing this salad tonight. Make sure you get six, you know, cases of lettuce and go to the saucier. We need this dressing, go to the bakery. You know, so it, it wasn't quite like that. It was, I was doing most of that, you know, and we were all of us in the kitchen were doing that. So the executive chef will say, okay, here's the menu for the week. And you know, we I'll put our heads down. Yes, chef. Plow through it. Yeah. <laughs> plow through it. Yeah. Um, so I did that for nine years. A position opened up in their law library. So I worked there for the other seven years. And uh, yeah, until I was uh, let go. So yeah, just wonderful experience. I don't figure. But you know what? In hindsight, you know, it, as much as I, I enjoyed that job there, I think getting laid off was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because you fell into MHV. Yeah, I fell into something yeah. that I, I really loved doing. And, and, and I happened to be good at it. I never would have known that I had the skill set in video mm. had I not <laughs> stepped in through, you know, Malden acts of television slash or media arts when I did and got the education and got the exposure and, and just, you know, had fun just doing video. Video production is fun. It's stressful. It can be stressful if you let it be stressful, but you know, it depends. we on had the, to set up a little bit here, but you know, once this is set up, you know, this is the fun part. You know, this is like the that. reward, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, yeah, it's, it's fun because equipment and getting to play with things and, um, I guess your path is not very traditional, so not at all. don't say people go be a sous chef if you're going to be a video producer, <laughs> right? Um, and then you want to be a student but again. <laughs> I do feel that just restaurant industry, work ethics, being on time, um, you know, some of the, I guess I tried to, to my, I've had a bunch of different jobs, so it, it wasn't just, I kind of like, I love what it is I do now. Um, but yeah, coming from, from the restaurant industry, 
is a, a lot of weird different and it was never at an arrival point. I guess you never are at an arrival point. Say, hey, this is this is the best. Because once you love something, you turn it into a job, you start loving it less. If you if you enjoy something for um, so let me ask you this. How would you say someone, young person, right? High school, let's say that James Munch guy, he does what he does is amazing. I want to what would he have done? What would right out of high school or first years of college? What would he have done? What would you have done differently to get to where you are, the director of um, and working with production right. yeah. first? Is I guess the question can be differently. Would a traditional path be necessary? So, for in your case, obviously it's not. But would it be? helpful to you because you're going back to school so right right a, i'm gonna shut up now yeah no 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 <laughs> no i mean that's a that's a great question i think i so there's two ways of looking at this you know had i make if i had the opportunity to get in the time machine you know get in the delorean marty mcfly and go back in time and change things would i be the same person as i am now right Answer if i no. made a bunch of you know earlier choices uh, or different choices um, I don't regret any of the choices that I've made. That's what, you know, the only one being that, you know, I did not pursue my higher education. So that's the one that's always been uh, gnawing at me. Um, I, I think one, for me, it wasn't clear on what it was that I wanted to do. I wasn't passionate about anything you know, in my youth. Where, you know, and it wasn't until, you know, later in life where I felt like, oh, okay, now I get it. All right, this is, all right, this, I want to pursue this. Mm -hmm. You know, it took me, you know, over 20, 30 years to get to that point. Uh, what would I do? I mean, I, to answer your question, I don't have an answer because I feel that each of us, it's a journey that we all have to make on ourselves. You know, I don't, I can't say to you, oh, you should have done this instead, you know. I can make recommendations, you know, I can talk about my own experiences, but ultimately each individual is the one that has to make the mistakes and learn from them. Mm. You know, try something and realize, oh, that isn't working for me very well, you know, or I, this is becoming more like a grind than it is a career. So you do that by trial and error sometimes, you know, sometimes you're lucky. It's like, you know, I knew at a young, like I'll use the, uh, uh, the mayor of Mullen, as an example, Gary Christensen, he knew in high school he wanted to be the mayor of the city. So he already had it figured out and he pursued it. That's rare. It's super rare. Yeah. To know, also lucky to know. Yeah. So, but he had a very that. clear vision. This is, I care about one thing. This is what I want to do. I <laughs> Let me ask you this. So, obviously, some of this equipment that we brought today mm. is borrowed from. Uma. Yes. So that's huge. Um, beyond that, it's the knowledge, it's the training, it's that. If someone decides to become a member, mm -hmm. why should they consider it? Why, why is it that they should become a member or just get involved? Just talk to their friends and family. Um, here's why I ask this question. It seems that um, social media is everywhere. And so there is value in good lighting systems and good cameras. There is value into that because you can do movies with your phone, sure, of course. But from having a marketable skill, I have a son and I'd say just get into pro video, pro audio production in any way. The demand is higher and higher. Um, and so how does Uma come into place? when someone is considered or someone has heard, I'm guaranteeing you eight out of 10 people don't even know what you guys do. Right, yeah, yeah. That's a question I wish the executive director was sitting here. Cause I'm sure that she had a very, she has the, the nice elevator pitch. Maybe I don't have my elevator next, pitch. The next guest, who yeah. is this? Tina, Tina Lagarde, so she's the executive Tina director, Lagarde. yeah. Okay. So you know that Ron retired, right? I do know Ron. Yes, retired. yes. So Ron Cox, the former executive director of MATV, he uh, retired, and that's uh, Tina Lagarde. She came out from the Midwest, and she brought 
all her um, Midwest sensibilities with her, and she's like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna do it this way, you know, we're gonna do it the. It it doesn't have to be an elevator pitch. You can I'm sh you're obviously knowledgeable and passionate about it, so you can. Yeah, the value is there. It, it, it's it, just not obvious. So for me, so for me, the challenge is explaining why traditional video cameras are better than you know what everyone's carrying around in their pocket now. You know, like yeah, I can take photos with this. I can shoot video with this. You know, and it's the quality on this camera, now this this phone is just as good as the one on this video camera. And probably, you know, about like, you know, one fifth of the cost, you know, this, you know, than the uh, camera that's on our tripod right now. And this is great for social media, you know, and if you want to do social media production and that's all you want to achieve, then yeah, the phone is fine for that, you know, and they, you know, we have some gear at Urban Media Arts, we have some gimbals, some stabilizers. They look like, you know, a little crane, you put your phone in, and it, you know you can walk around, and it keeps the instead of having the shaky, you know, shaky camera look, it stabilizes it. It just keeps the camera centered in space. So as you move the handle around, the camera stays in place. So we have that technology, if that's what you're looking to do, and it's great. Like if you're going on to, uh, in fact, that um, a lot of the gear that we got was from the uh, Porch Fest, the Malden Porch Fest. Mm -hmm. We partnered with them. They said, hey, we want to have people come out with their cameras and record, you know, the performances that are happening on happening on around the city. And we our response was, hey, we have some great gear there. We can't really afford it. You know, can we work out something? You know, can you partner with us? We'll provide the, the, the tech and, you know, that the attendance will provide the video. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had that partnership and um, uh, that's how we got those stabilizers. And it was a. Wonderful, wonderful uh, experience, I think, for both of us. You know, just being able to move through space and have a nice, steady shot, you know, instead of having that, like, oh, you ever see those uh, uh, camera views where people are, like, running with the camera and it looks like, oh, my word, what's happening? It's sort of an earthquake happening. That's absolutely absent with this uh, technology. I'm droning on a little bit about that. But anyway, no, so, but anyway, so, so, um, so my feeling is that anyone who's interested in doing television production, you know, specifically, you know, if that's the type of production that you're attracted to, that's something that we do. We have three channels that we show content on. So we have the public channel, which is kind of like a general discussion, mm -hmm. um, the arts and opinions that all goes on the uh, public channel. Uh, any of the government meetings are shown on the government channel. And anything uh, related to the schools it goes on the education channel. Um, so like the graduation, the football game, those shown on the edge. So all of them are on cable? They're all on cable, yes. And you have to have that cable subscription in order to watch it on television. You can still go online and watch the video on demand. Like you know, going on YouTube, you can watch the videos on there also. But uh, in terms of putting it on television, like an honest to goodness television set, you know, the one in your living room. I mean, yeah, so yeah, uh, that's, so for individuals who are interested about doing studio productions, television studio with you know, television cameras, we have that, we have, they have that opportunity at our Urban Media Arts. Or if they want to use a video camera on location, you know, we, Happy to teach them on that. You know, worst comes to worst, you can always just use your phone. You know, the one the big crack on it because you dropped it three times. If that's what you want to use for your gear, yeah, sure. I hear you, but also um, there's you know there's so many. It it was a little overwhelming before choosing equipment. I have to say, just just go. I luckily I had a friend to help me out with here. Would you say that one camera is good? Would you say that two camera or three camera or the more complications, the less fun it's going to become so for me? My recommendation is that start recording with one camera, right? Get that to an a point where you feel very comfortable with it, where it's no longer, do I have to make a decision here? You know, mm. or, you know, I don't know what to do under this new circumstance that I do not face with my other production. So once you have, a couple of productions under your belt with one camera. 
then you can say, okay, I think I'm ready for two cameras. But the thing about that is typically you need an additional frame, right, to go with you on production. You could well, just, you know, what we call down a lockdown camera, where you essentially you set the camera and forget. So you set it and forget it. Um, personally, I feel that if you're going to have two cameras, one of them needs to be operated by someone. You need someone that's, you know, zooming in on that guitarist who's playing, you know, that, that wonderful solo on stage, or the, uh, uh, the singer who's, you know, doing their um, solo. Um, or even just a parade, you know, just getting a close-up of the people who are just passing by within the parade. I no, feel that for this show specifically. Oh, specific, oh this, this, yeah. This so would, one of them would be on the person's face, and the other be on the second person's right. face. Right. So, and they have uh, little remote uh, switchers that you can use also. So essentially, you would take a. Uh, oh, so what you're describing, you could do that. Uh, you can uh, do all the cross cutting in post production, right? Or if you have like a little switcher here, you can make it, you know, live, you know, so you can be switching live and that's called a hot set. Like the reeling that do it. So reeling actually there, they have somebody in the control room doing that. Which I wouldn't right. have, but just be me. On, for you and me. I, so it'd be, you would have like a little box maybe on your knee, on your lap, laps or something. Um, and this is called a, a hot set. So it's host operated television. Right, mm. so when, instead of having a switcher behind the camera or like another technician behind the scenes making those decisions, you are the one making the, those decisions in real live time. in real time there. That'd be so if I'm talking, yeah. so you essentially you say, like, okay, I'm gonna press camera three now and that's Jim's shot, you know, that's Jim's camera. So I'm talking, 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 and like, all right, you've been on me for a long time, like over nine seconds, it's time to break, break it up. So there's rules. There's, 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 there's a like structure. This a can structure. become a little tedious, right? Or it can become a little boring, let's right, say, because the, visually. The, yeah, so yeah, there's no variance in terms of what's happening. It's just the two of us talking in a camera, you know, and, and we're doing it for a long time, and it's not a lot of um, variance mm -hmm. in that. So using different cameras. Is it recording? Yeah. Okay, we're rolling. And we're back. And we're back. We so found, I don't know where we left off. We but found the limit of this camera. Yeah. And it's 45 minutes. <laughs> so that's the reference. battery. So um, that's the, the battery. But yeah. So um, um, we a lesson learned here. So we're going to keep this uh, plugged in going forward. And, um, I think we were talking about Uma. Like we were so I remember we were talking about uh, members using multiple multiple cameras, cameras for my show. For you're right. You're right. Yes. Um, uh, so right, so the, the point that I think we were uh, acknowledging is that this is a single camera production, so it's just Serge and I sitting here at a table, and there's not a lot of variance with the, um, we don't have a camera operator, so we've done a lot, we've locked the camera down. If we had a camera operator, then you know, we could have somebody zoom in on us, and I'll zoom out. Hello. Hello. This is what happens when you shoot live in a working, <laughs> in a working environment. <laughs> yep, that's right. And yeah, this is an operational business, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so you could do the post-production um, uh, afterwards if you had multiple cameras, or you could have a, a switcher where you would be making live switches. I'm curious. Which is less work, you know, ultimately, essentially, you're making more work for yourself during the production, but there's less work post-production. Curious right? how the um, audio is going to sound. Does this have to be a certain length or does yeah, it? Typically, yeah. It, you typically want, this is about a where distance. you want it. Yeah. And that's not the closer, the better usually or no? Well, the trade-off on that is, um, is, for example, if I start getting excited and I start talking really loud, you know, and I have this camera, the uh, microphone right against me, it's going to sound like garbage, right? But I can tune that down. It's way more work, though, right? right? Is to yes, you I mean you yeah you can write you can ride the the audio levels on it, uh, but the, the the problem is that um, uh, sometimes if I'm too loud and the camera's too close, you're over modulating the audio, and there's no recovery from that. So essentially, you know, audio is a wave, right? Right. And there's only there's a ceiling and a floor where you know how much space audio can go through, right? So when I, when I start yelling into the microphone, that audio wave is 
hitting the ceiling, scraping along the ceiling, then it's going right down to the floor, scraping along the floor. So that's how you get distorted audio. Mm. Um, so um, yeah, so um, it's this is one of the things reasons why it's um, challenging doing a production by yourself. Uh, it's it's great. It's more helpful, I should say, to have somebody behind the camera who can tell you, "Hey, the battery stopped," <laughs> <laughs> so we're not talking for ten minutes. You know the. Uh, <laughs> With no uh, camera you on. You noticed. I didn't even notice. I was mm. looking at you the whole time. Yeah, I time. don't think we were off for very long. And also so. someone who's monitoring the audio. It's like, okay, yeah, you guys are getting really loud. It's like, oh, I cannot hear you at all. I need to make an adjustment on the input here. Yeah. Um, I also hope we don't talk over, or I don't talk over. Oh, whoa. What just happened? He just tripped. I shouldn't have that. Well, we weren't expecting the, uh, the guests. Yeah, the uh, foot traffic. <laughs> and also situations where that, you know, mm -hmm. fortunately nothing happened, but it's good that you had, and going back to what we were talking about, why it's nice to have a wide stance on these stands, you know? Yeah. Switching right. gears. Switching gears. James Munch, we can, um, why Malden? Ah, so Malden was a lucky draw for me. So I was married. I was living in Somerville. The marriage ran its course. We separated on amicable terms. How long ago was this? This was uh, 1998. Okay. So, um, so uh, after uh, my wife and I divorced, I was looking for a place to live, and I happened to find a place in Walden, and I've been here ever since. It's been 25 years. I've moved 10 times in 10 years. Oh, my soul. So... <laughs> lived in California, I lived in Colorado, I lived in uh, Martha's Vineyard, in oh. Italy, Romania, Moldova. Molden is it. Molden is the place. I can't totally articulate it. Um, I have some things, but I want to hear your opinion. Why do you think it's so great? What, what makes it so great? The diversity of the population here, of this community, it's just, it's just absolutely wonderful. So and, the, and the restaurants reflect that, ladies and gentlemen. Just a lot of great places. What reflects? I'm sorry. Hey, how you doing? Hey, Damien is here. <laughs> yeah, it's um, open in a way, open-minded in a way that I haven't experienced it uh, from all level. It was also it kind of, we kind of fell into it. We took over the space, uh, which also was a coffee shop. Um, there was actually two failed coffee shops before us here. There's Ryan and there's another gentleman. So we knew going in, it'd be, it wouldn't be easy. It would be, but the local people, the local government, very helpful. It was beyond uh, Kevin Duffy, our good friend now. He's, his job is to have businesses come to Molden. That's his only job. And he would say, we open in seven weeks, which is unheard of. From the moment we signed the lease, wow. from the moment we opened wow. seven weeks, it was not two full months. And it's all thanks to Kevin Duffy. I say it all the time because we would be on the door knocking, hey, what do you guys need? What do you not need? It was, it was the opposite of red tape. And so just to, <laughs> just to hear- No, always showed up with the red cut, the uh, red tape, uh, Wire cutters, or <laughs> yeah, we did the grand ceremony yeah. and the um, yeah, it was it was amazing. So that's where we have I have my family now. This is where my son was born, and mm. so um, we live close by. It's it's just it's just awesome. Um, I don't want to hype it too much <laughs> to get that, everyone to get all that in place. Yeah, all thing. of the people. So it has its perks. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's um, yeah. For me, it was just a lucky draw. I mean, that was yeah. You know, I, I went to a couple of places. I remember looking at an apartment in Winthrop. Mm. It's like, wow, this is really like, it's a lovely little place. It was a quiet street. It's like close to the water. Yeah, you know, the water was right. You know, the ocean was right down the street. And it's like I don't understand why you know no one's jumping. Else is jumping on this. And then I went outside. An airplane, a low airplane, went right overhead. Mm. I'm like, oh, there's the answer right there. And it's like, okay, what else? What other options do I have? <laughs> not, yeah, not many. 
So what do you hope to, after you finish school, what do you hope to, to get done? I in the am, next five years, well, yeah, you know, years. I'm not looking that far ahead right now. I mean, so I probably, it would be smart of me to do that. It's like, all right, in 10 years, where do I want to be? I, mean, I uh, still, I still see myself being in Malden. Okay. Um, do you hope to travel some? Do you hope to not? Are you a big traveler? I enjoy traveling. I have a very different way of traveling though. I do not plan for my trips. This is a true story. So I was meeting some, um, uh, some friends in Kansas City, Missouri. This is back in 1999. Okay. Um, I show up at the airport. Now I was there two weeks early. So I, I have two weeks. It's like, okay, well I have some time. I rented a car, got out a map, looked east, looked south, looked west. Okay, let's start by driving west. And I started two weeks, I went out west. I did essentially made a big circle in the middle of the United States. I went out to Kansas, down through Texas, went back over through Louisiana and Mississippi, up through Arkansas and back into Missouri. Over no plans. All, all improv too. Hmm. I, and I had a I had a ball doing it. I, I had an absolute blast. Just it was you know every it, I did not like okay well first day I'm going to be spending on this state and then I'm going right. to you know I don't I don't like the I'm not that organized I'm not that structured. I've learned I used to I used to plan meticulously but then one thing goes wrong and I feel like the whole vacation is ruined. Um, don't do that anymore. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, like oh, I didn't go to plan. Yeah. Like, how do I fix it? Or now you're focused on, oh, how do I, you know, how do I recover from this? It's like, eh. if something like that happened to me, it's like, oh, I wasn't expecting this, but hey, it's part of the journey here, right? Go <laughs> with the flow, James Munch. That's, that's that should be the that should be the, t the title of this episode. Is <laughs> go with the flow. Yeah, no James kidding, Munch. right? That seems to be the whole story of my life, right? But in a in a in a good way. Yeah. You know, it's if you had some advice for me with this. Um, for production? For anything, in general. I mean, it can be technical, it can be large scale, because you've done this a bunch. Mm -hmm. um, and so, what am I missing? What am I not missing? What should I focus on? Because um, I already have a short list of guests, so that's not a big issue. Um, it's just people um, I like and, and I want to talk to. But more from the... I know sometimes making the little changes can have a tremendous effect. And then after that is just, um, what do you call it? Diminishing returns. So obviously having some lights, which I yep. do. Yep. Obviously having a good camera. Mm -hmm. I do think in the future I'll upgrade to two or even three. Just because I want that dynamic. Even two would be more something... I'm speaking, camera can be on me, your speaking can be on right. yours, but what are some areas that I could improve? Just to give, without too much work, without hiring a crew, right. without, right. you know, any of that so, stuff. So, step number one, become comfortable with your production. Mm -hmm. Do this a couple of times. Make your mistakes and learn from them. So, things like, oh, okay. the Gaffer batter, tape. The ga yeah, gaffer tape for the wires so people aren't tripping over the lighting cables there. Uh, plugging in the camera, not relying on the uh, the battery. Right. We learned those so, two things. Yeah. So two, and they're, they're things like, okay, all right, now I know, you know, in this production. Uh, so go through those. Enjoy the process also. Really don't don't feel like, oh my word, this is this is too overwhelming. This is too much work. It is a lot of work. But if you break it down to small steps, you know, first of all, you know, first was scheduling a time. You know, that's usually the big challenge. I find that 90% of my, uh, the, the challenges that I face on a production is just scheduling the time. You know, when is this going to happen? Once that happens, it's just showing up with the gear, setting it up, you know, doing the production itself. Rolling. Yeah. And then from there, it's going to be, you know, um, uh, the post-production, right? So you're like, okay, we have an hour, you know, but we want this to be a 15-minute show. Where are the 15 best minutes, the absolutely best minutes in this production? As an editor, you're going to make those type of choices. 
and go through it. You're going to review this? And say, well, I'm assuming you're going to review this and take out yeah. the, the flubs. And, no, uh, I think I'll just leave it like this. And that's, uh, and that's absolutely fine it's here. It's part of like coffee with surge. It's some things happen. Life happens, right? Yep. And it's yep. maybe some of the things, maybe they want to cut off the power or something or in the beginning. Right. Cut it, but it's just yeah. a conversation. Right, it's, right, there's right. There's no, it's all a moment in time. <laughs> it's a fleeting moment in time that we've captured it. That way, with you know, beautiful it, light hey, that's and a sound. lovely way of thinking about this. Yeah. We just we captured a moment. Yeah, we captured that's a moment all video in time. Is. Yeah. It's there's no constraints. Maybe I don't want to go past an hour. I feel like which we're oh, what do we know? It's exactly an hour since we've been talking. Good night, everyone. No. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I don't want to go too far right. past me, yeah, like right. around an hour. Um because like a sweet spot, maybe where I get more comfortable, I'm not very skilled at interviewing, I would say. But also, I don't want this to be an interview. Yeah. No, I just I... want this to be a conversation. I want it to, to know, to get to know people, to yeah. find it, learn, definitely learn a lot today. Well, with the lights, and with the camera, and with the setup. And, um, do you think it's adequate? Can I use the other two lights I have? Or is it better, best not to complicate it? My recommendation, like a backlight somewhere, or my no? recommendation is that so your next task mm -hmm. is that you're going to review this footage, and we should talk about how we're going to get this to you, uh, the uh, footage to you. Just right? Download it, no? Hmm? Could download it. Yeah, we can talk off camera. We okay. don't need to. We don't need to solve this problem <laughs> right here on yeah. camera. Here, um, but uh, review the footage and look at it. it's like, hmm, you know what, you know. There's, you know, a really dark shadow here or, you know, this is overlit. You know, this is too shiny or too bright here. And then for the next production, it's like, oh, yeah, I remember it was too bright. So maybe dim this down a little bit or, you know, mm. this is too dark. So let's bring this up a bit. So, again, it's going to be a series until you find that sweet spot, right? Where it's like, okay, now I know how many lights I need. I know where to position them. I know where to position the microphones to get that, you know, the perfect audio. There's going to be you know, a couple of productions where you know we're just like we're we're figuring it out, right? Especially in this space. You know? Should this be on on Emmy on Uma? I will be insulted if it's not. Okay, what does that mean? I edit it and I product it and I just bring it to you and you post it somewhere. Yep. Okay. Yeah. But so what I'll do is so sure. my uh, so I have two titles. I am the director of programming and production. So right now we've been doing talking a lot about production, but for programming, so. Once you have this, you're going to give me, you know, here's the name. Here's a short description. So when people look at the program schedule, they say, oh, you know, uh, Coffee with Surge or Coffee with Bikinis or coffee whatever. Coffee with Surge, yeah. Yeah, Coffee with Surge. James okay, yes. Yeah. Go yeah. with the flow. A little, yeah, a little uh, description of it. So um, uh, people looking at the schedule will know what to expect. And then uh, I'll find a spot somewhere in our schedule, you know, you're a local producer, so you're guaranteed twice a week that we'll be seeing your show. What? Yep. I did That's not one of the benefits that. of being. Yep. So I was just thinking of putting it on YouTube or in Spotify. Um, sure. I mean, you can do that in addition to getting correct. it on our yes. channel. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. In yeah. addition to. Um, yeah. Having it, I listen to Spotify all the time. Yeah. Just have it. So, and, and also, the uh, one of the nice things about this is that, you know, depending on. Um, uh, the uh, uh, how it sounds, you can just play as a podcast, right? It doesn't need, we don't need the video component to this uh, conversation. Although it kind of, if I start referencing, you know, like, oh, this wonderful book here is like, well, what is he pointing at? Or I imagine he's pointing to a book, you know? Right. You're missing the visual We didn't component. do many of those. Yeah, I mean, no, there's not no. Much, there's not much. To, no, no, if I, see. but if I, you know, it's just, yeah, show up with the guy, uh, whatever that I want to talk about. I, I know I referenced my phone earlier. I think well, everybody's got one of these, and I just leave it at that. And like, what are they talking about? So, these services like mm. Apple Podcast, mm -hmm. Spotify. Mm -hmm. I've learned from Ron Cochran, um, who's actually also uh, hopefully coming on this show. He's also into production a lot. Um, he does a lot of production. Yes. yes. So he he I just want to learn from the best, and he. He said, yeah, sure, we'll do it. He told me, I didn't even know, that they are basically a link to something. So you upload it to a service. It's not Spotify doesn't host it for you or right. Apple doesn't host right. it for you. So 
where should I host it? Right. So I think uh, there's, there's services, right? Yeah. So I think An Anchor and Acorn, I think those are two services that we use. Okay. Both. You use both? I can't remember which one. So I typically do not. It's funny. I'm the director of uh, uh, production, and uh, but I, when it comes to podcasts, I, I'm hands off on that one. Who is it? Who is so it? it's Tolonzo. Tolonzo. So usually, typically, uh, Tolonzo is the one who uh, handles the podcast. Uh, we do a production 02148, which is uh, uh, Ed Lucy, former mayor of Malden, and also Mike Sharone. Uh, and it's like interviews like this, but it's done at the studio. Trelonzo will take the audio from that and make a podcast version of it, mm. and then he uploads that. Uh, I can find out. I'll, yeah, I'll so he would be the person. He's more yeah. knowledgeable about that than I am. Because yeah. I don't... I'll just do whatever he says, because I don't know better. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> And again, it's one of those things. Well, this is, you know, this has been my approach, and I've been very happy, and it's, I find that it's been very successful, you know, working yeah. with this uh, this service. So, uh, yeah, you can always start with that, and then if you feel like, oh, it's not meeting the needs because I want to do this, then it doesn't do that, then you can start looking elsewhere. But, you know, if anything, it's a good starting point, whatever it, whatever it recommends. I've taken too much of your time. <laughs> Thank you, James. I appreciate Thank you, so you much, Serge. for coming today and for educating me on all things cameras. Um, I look forward to this. I hope once a week, but let's start with once a month because this took the first episode took three years. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, the next one doesn't take three years. So, if I shoot for one a month and then I do two Which a month, I feel that's very obtainable. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's all a matter of. Because of my low expectations from this, um, it's all a matter of putting it in the calendar um, and maybe just showing up. That's what life is, mostly showing up. And then, yep, that's 90% of the job right there. So, you show up on time, and then the rest of it is just thank you. enjoy it. Enjoy thank you, the experience. Thank you very much. This was, this was a blast. I didn't even realize. Luckily, I started a timer. Um, on my on my watch because otherwise I wouldn't have known how long we've been blabbing. Yeah. But thank you, thank you. Uh, we'll see you around for the people at home. Um, join MATV. That's all I can say. Um, UrbanMediaArts.org. Yep. I'm sorry. Yep. Yes, uh, UMA. Join yes. UMA. Um, it's coming I've, to the UMAverse. What is it? Five bucks a month. It's, it's a coffee. Five. Yeah. Five it's dollars per month. We'll and get you. what it gets you is access to wonderful people that are knowledgeable if you ever need to produce anything. But more importantly is citizens uh, journalism. So Neighborhood being yep. no agenda, hyper local, just things I care. I don't care. I don't watch any news. It's just eat nowhere I watch. I feel like whatever needs to get to my ears will arrive. But this local stuff, I'm very curious. I'm super interested in potholes. I'm super interested in yeah. power outages. Yeah. I'm super interested in what else is about the zoning planning board is going to happen and change. And I know that my voice is heard and I can change things if I need to. Or I can ask advice from people. So being that you guys give voice to what's going on in the city... This is reason alone to go buy Uma a coffee. Um, and, and that has happened. Yeah. Where we have done a show, like the, for the example is uh, uh, we were at a cemetery and we were showing the poor conditions of the cemeteries here in Malden. And sure enough, next summer, everything was fixed. Perfect. Yeah. And, and That's what and, you want. And it's an example yeah. of how community media can actually make a change within the community. And I'm not just... This isn't a reason, um, you know, this is not why I'm doing the no, podcast or whatnot. No. It's just an awesome organization. I do, I really, I, it's just volunteering there and being involved and having Osa here and being friends with you and Robin and every, everybody else. It's just good hearted people doing hard work. And if, I mean, really, uh, $5, if you can't afford it, obviously, but if you can, buy someone a coffee. It should be Jim's mom. <laughs> That's how you get your wages, right? This is how you get a job. So yeah. Please. And also, if you're really curious about learning, I mean, we do have a, a volunteer program where you can trade membership 
uh, just by um, uh, do, putting in some volunteering, some hours. And it's fun. I can. And I see test. that the S. You know what? The SD card may be full. You see how the SD card is flashing? The what? little thing in the center, the little Has square. Has that been flashing a long time? Probably. I don't know. <laughs> I bet you this thing filled up, which is why it powered down. Two it's, minutes. It's two minutes. Oh, okay. two minutes. Okay. Just two minutes on the right. Is that going to be gone out of memory in two minutes? I don't know. So let's. So let's wrap it up. Good night, everyone. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Bye. And you just, uh, uh, in just like a moment. Okay. Bottoms down. And. That should cut. be enough. Yep.